Welcome to Chapter 2, Part 2, Chemical Principles. Now in this section we're going to discuss water and organic compounds. Under the category of water we're going to be discussing solutions, acids, bases, and salts, pH, and buffers. If you take salt and put it into water, what happens? It disappears. It dissolves. If you taste the water, it's still salty. The salt is still there. What's happening on a molecular basis is the water, because it has a slight positive and a slight negative end, can interact with the ions of sodium chloride. Okay, So here's what's happening. The sodium ions say, hey, hi, water. And the chloride ion says, hey, hi, water. And they separate. We call this dissolving. Okay. Now, water can do this because of its slight positive charge and slight negative charge. It can also do this with molecules that are hydrophilic. Okay. So, for example, sugar is not an ionic compound, but it does have um, oxygens bonded to hydrogens, so it can do the same thing. So when you add sugar to water, it dissolves. Okay. Now, we call this a solution, either a salt solution or a sugar solution. The solid stuff that you put into water we call a solute. And we call water the solvent. You put a solute and a solvent together and you get a solution. Now water is important because it's the universal solvent. It can dissolve most things. And your cells exist as a water solution. So it becomes very important in biology. From here, we're going to discuss what else happens in different types of solutions. There are two types of ionic substances. Those like hydrochloric acid that release hydrogen protons, pro hydrogen ions, into water when they dissolve. We call this an acid. That's why we call it hydrochloric acid. There's also those that when they're put into water, they release a hydrogen-oxygen bonded ion. We call this a hydroxide ion. And these have a tendency to combine with any hydrogens that are floating around in the water and form more water. We call these bases. So an acid is anything that releases hydrogens in solution. A base is anything that removes hydrogens from solution, namely if it has a hydroxide ion. Or, we'll get to this later on in this chapter, an ammonium ion. Okay. Now, if you combine an acid with a base in solution, they will combine and make a salt and water. These hydrogen and hydroxide ions get together to make H2O. The sodium and the chloride get together to make sodium chloride. We call that a salt. Both acids and bases are important in biology as well as salts since your cells are composed of both. And your cells are very busy keeping the balance between acids and bases. To measure whether something is more acidic or more basic, we have a pH scale. It's based on how many hydrogen ions, how many free protons, are floating around in the solution. Now, this is a scale that goes both up and down. So let's start at the middle, or the starting, the starting point. This is where we're considered to be neutral, where you have equal numbers of hydrogen ions and in this case hydroxide ions or ions that are taking hydrogen ions out of solution. This is a pH of 7. Pure water is considered to be a pH of 7. Now as we go to smaller numbers or down the scale, unfortunately the scale has it going up, and as the pH lowers you get increasingly more and more hydrogens. So if you look at the substances that are listed as they get more and more acidic you can recognize that. They get, uh, when you taste them, more sour, more corrosive, 
Okay, so milk is just a little bit acidic. Urine is just a little bit more acidic. Tomato juice, it's kind of tart unless you've got some nice garden fresh tomatoes and wine grapefruit juice lemon juice stomach acid is a pH of between two and one now going the other direction this is where you have fewer and fewer hydroxide excuse me fewer and fewer hydrogen ions versus hydroxide ions or anything removing hydrogens so human blood is just a little bit basic or alkaline is another term for it seawater is a little bit more alkaline milk of magnesia um, that's back and most of you are probably not familiar with that they still sell it but use it for an upset stomach so if you have too much acid you drink something that's a little bit basic to neutralize the acid and create salts ammonia you wouldn't want to drink that household bleach wouldn't want to drink that and you get to oven cleaner that's our sodium hydroxide that we had in the last slide and lime water okay now your body needs to stay at a pH of just a little bit alkaline. So it uses buffers to maintain that pH. Buffers are salts or more usually weak acids or weak bases that can adjust to an increase or decrease in hydrogen ions by either um, taking up hydrogen ions or releasing them. In this next section we're going to be talking about organic compounds. Now, there's two definitions of organic. There's the one that you're more familiar with, which is actually the newer definition, which is produce, usually, sometimes it's meat too, that has been raised without the aid of artificial fertilizers, no pesticides, no herbicides, etc. The older definition, which we're going to be going with, is anything that is made out of carbon attached to hydrogen. Okay, so make sure that you remember that is the definition of organic. In this category, we're going to talk about hydrocarbons, functional groups, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and proteins. Hydrocarbons are any molecules that are composed strictly of just carbon and hydrogen. Hence, hydrocarbon. Yes, organic chemists have senses of humor too. Here's an example of a hydrocarbon nothing but carbon and hydrogen and you'll notice we've got lines representing single covalent bonds now these covalent bonds are nonpolar because there's no oxygen no nitrogen okay this is your basic organic molecule in this case it's forming a line or a chain now they can also flip around to form circles. Now in this case you'll notice that I've left out the hydrogens. If I were to put all the hydrogens in there it would get kind of messy. In fact oftentimes organic chemists will abbreviate it still further and just draw the shape of the molecule. Here you're given to understand that at each point there's a carbon. Okay. Now the question arises how do I know how many hydrogens how do I know that there's carbons here? Okay. Well, if you'll notice, carbon, remember that carbon needs four electrons to share. So it can form four bonds. So if I only show one bond, you well, excuse me, one bond here, one bond here, this carbon is shown with only two bonds. So we know that there's hydrogen sticking off here. And with the abbreviation where I'm showing you just a shape, the points are showing where the carbons are, and I'm going to actually draw out the parts that are actually of interest. Okay. Now, back to organic molecules. <coughs> Carbon is considered the foundation of life because it can form these four bonds. Because it can form four bonds, it can form any shape you like by hooking up with a variety of different molecules. Now hydrogen is important in organic chemistry but it can only form one bond. So you'll notice with each of these hydrogens there's only one line going from each H. Four from carbon, one from hydrogen. Now oxygen can form two bonds so you're going to see just two lines coming from oxygen. Nitrogen can form three sulfur can form two, phosphorus can form five. As you look at these 
various hydrocarbons, you'll notice that they are all hydrophobic. They can't dissolve in water because they don't have any oxygen, they don't have any nitrogen. They, all of the covalent bonds are nonpolar, and so there's no charge. Now from here we're going to be talking about some functional groups. These are groups of molecules that you can add to your basic hydrocarbon to change its nature. Most of them make that part of the molecule hydrophilic. Okay. So let's go and talk about the functional groups. Now the way that I remember things is by remembering what's different. Of the different functional groups there's one that's hydrophobic all the rest are hydrophilic. So all I have to remember is the one hydrophobic one. There's also two acidic functional groups. I'll have you watch for them. And one basic functional group. Okay. So let's look at the methyl group. It is a carbon attached to three hydrogens. When you draw it out it looks like this. Now over here would be the rest of the hydrocarbon. So if you had to make a guess, would you consider this one to be hydrophilic or hydrophobic? It's hydrophobic. There's no oxygen, no nitrogen. Now the next one is the hydroxyl or alcohol group. It's an oxygen bonded to a hydrogen. Now because this goes as a group, we generally leave out the covalent bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. But it's a polar covalent bond. Remember the oxygen is stealing um, the electrons partially from the hydrogen so the electrons are going woo woo oh over here once woo 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 over here once and so we get a little bit of a charge. Now with this when you add this to a hydrocarbon it makes that part of the hydrocarbon hydrophilic and makes it so it can hydrogen bond with water. Now the book talks about ethers. Those are a bond. It's not a functional group, but it's where you take two hydrocarbons and hook them together by means of an oxygen. Now the carbonyl group is a double bonded oxygen that you put on to a hydrocarbon. Now it doesn't have a hydrogen attached to it, so it can't really hydrogen bond, but it does make the molecule more hydrophilic because of this double bond, the oxygen is stealing those electrons part of the time from the carbon. So you get just a little bit of a negative charge enough that water will interact with it. Now when this is in the middle of a molecule we call it a ketone. If it's on the end we call a molecule an aldehyde. Later on in chapter 5 you're going to see lots of ketones and lots of aldehydes. The, now let's talk about the carboxyl group. We call it this because it's kind of a combination of a, a carbonyl group where you have a double bonded oxygen and a hydroxyl group. Okay, So we call it our carboxyl and this is what it looks like. This is how it's going to be abbreviated in your text, COOH. This is what it looks like when it's drawn out. Here you can see you've got your double bonded oxygen, you've got your hydroxyl group. Now this oxygen doesn't have a real good hold on this hydrogen. So this hydrogen has a tendency to leave its electrons with the oxygen and take off into solution. So this is an acidic group. It loses that hydrogen. Okay. And it becomes, this part of the molecule develops a full negative charge because the oxygen has the electron. Okay. So it's an acid. Now if you're looking at a molecule and you're looking to see if it's an acid, you look for that negative charge. This next one that the book mentions is an ester. Once again, it's not really a functional group. It's a bond, but this time you have two oxygens hooking together. Now let's talk about the amino group. Oh, excuse me. Uh, the est this is what the ester group looks like, where you have a carbon with a double bonded oxygen and then you have another oxygen there. Now let's talk about the amino group. This is a nitrogen with two hydrogens. Remember, nitrogens can form three bonds.
this is what it looks like when it's drawn out. Okay, now this nitrogen has a tendency to pick up hydrogen ions from solution. So it comes along, and so this nitrogen has one extra proton in association with it than it has electrons. So this gives it a positive charge. This also makes it our basic functional group. So if you're looking at a molecule and you're trying to decide whether it's an acid or a base, if you p see a positive on it, then you know it's a base. Okay? And in biology, it's generally going to be the amino group. Now let's look at the phosphate group. Now remember, phosphates can form five bonds, so we can stick all sorts of stuff on a phosphate. This is how you're going to see it in your textbook when it's abbreviated. This is what it looks like when it's drawn out. Okay, So you've got the rest of your organic molecule here. You've got your phosphate with four oxygens, one of which is double bonded. Now it has a tendency to lose the hydrogens off of these oxygens. It's just like the carboxyl group or the other acid group. And those hydrogens leave their electrons with the oxygens and head off into the solution, usually looking for an amino group. Okay, So this is our other acidic functional group. And our last one is the sulfhydryl. This is a sulfur attached to a hydrogen. Now this becomes important when we talk about proteins because if you get two sulfhydryl groups together, they're going to lose their hydrogens and they're going to form a bond between it and that has a tendency to stabilize proteins. So those are all of our functional groups. Charge indicator. Now that you have the basics of organic chemistry, let's talk about our four major groups of organic molecules. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We're going to start out with carbohydrates. First off, let's look at the formula for a carbohydrate. All carbohydrates reduce to the formula one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen. In other words, it's a carbon that has a water or it's been hydrated. Yes, organic chemists have senses of humor. <laughs> so if you look at a formula for a carbohydrate, then if you count them up, you should be able to see CH2O. So for example, if I see a molecule that has a, a formula of C6H12O6, that reduces down to CH2O. Okay. Now the functions of carbohydrates are to store energy and for structure. They also communicate, but we're not going to worry about that function in this class. Okay. Now carbohydrates can hook together to form huge macromolecules or huge big molecules. So let's look at, um, at a monosaccharide. So here we've got a glucose and a fructose. Okay, They're both six carbon molecules. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, And you'll notice there are six oxygens. One, two, three, four, five, six. And if you were to count all of them, including the hydrogens that haven't been drawn in, there are 12 of them. Now fructose also has the same molecular formula, but you notice it looks a little bit different. Now these are considered monosaccharides. Okay, Saccharide comes from the Greek for, um, for sugar or sweet. Okay, So these are monosugars. Okay. Now we can hook two of them together to make a disaccharide. Okay. So you'll notice that in this process we're going to take a hydroxide group off of the glucose, we're going to take a hydrogen off of the fructose, and if you put them together, what do you make? Water. Okay. And they're hooked together with the remaining oxygen. So I have a glucose over here, I have the fructose over here, they're hooked together with one oxygen, and I have a water left over. This is called a dehydration reaction because I'm removing water. Okay. And I've made a disaccharide. Now I can keep doing this and make a polysaccharide or a big carbohydrate that's a chain of monosaccharides. Now with the 
removal of water, would this be an exergonic reaction or an endergonic reaction? Because we're going from two small molecules to a bigger molecule, then it's exergonic requires energy. Okay. Now, we can reverse this. In biology, most reactions are reversed. We can take this water, put it in here, break these two molecules apart, arrive at two uh, monosaccharides. Okay. We call this a hydrolysis or hydrolytic reaction because we're using water to break apart the molecule. Lysis is Latin for breaking. Okay. On to the lipids. All of the big organic molecules that have biological functions that are hydrophobic, we have a tendency to lump together. Therefore, the lipids are a heterogeneous group, or they're all really different in structure and molecular formula. The way you can recognize them is there's not a whole lot of oxygen in them, not a whole lot of nitrogen. They're mainly hydrocarbons. They do have a few oxygens in there. Their functions within the cell are energy storage, fats contain calories, they're also structure, um, the membranes of cells are made up of lipids. You want to keep the outside out and the inside in. And also communication in the form of hormones in multicellular organisms. Now let's talk about the major groups of lipids. You have your simple lipids. Now lipids have a tendency to be ridiculously huge molecules. So let's look at a simple lipid. Now we've got this molecule here, which is a glycerol. It's actually an alcohol. Look at all of those hydrocarbons. Excuse me, all of those hydroxyl groups. That makes this molecule very hydrophilic. Now you take this fatty acid. It's got an acid on one end, and it's got this big, long hydrocarbon. Now this is a good opportunity to discuss the idea of being ampipathic. That's where a molecule has two different characteristics on both ends. Okay. So a fatty acid is hydrophilic on the acidic end, hydrophobic on the rest of it. This becomes important later when we talk about cell membranes. So we remove a hydroxyl, uh, hydroxyl group from the acid portion of the fatty acid, we remove an H from the glycerol, and we hook it together. Okay. Now what kind of reaction is this where we remove a water? That's right, it's a dehydration. Requires energy. So we do this same process and we add more fatty acids. Now this one has a kink in it because we have a double bond here. Because there's a double bond, this carbon has one, two, three, four bonds. This carbon has one, two, three, four bonds. So it's missing a hydrogen gives it a kink. Now this fatty acid is considered saturated. It's saturated with hydrogens, has as many hydrogens as it can have. This one down below is also a saturated fatty acid. Here it's an unsaturated because we could put two more hydrogens there. Now this is the difference between um, saturated fats and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats would have all saturated fatty acids. Unsaturated fats have a tendency to have um, uh, a fatty acid that doesn't have all the hydrogens that it can have. Now in nutrition there's been a lot of debate between the health benefits of saturated fats versus unsaturated fats. Now you understand at least molecularly what they're talking about. Now let's talk about complex lipids. So we take a, this uh, particular lipid is a uh, triglyceride. Okay, we've got a glyceride here, tri for the three fatty acids. And if we were, now I've, the, this diagram has it tipped on its side, so we have a glycerol here. We've got two fatty acids. One of them's got a kink in it. It's got its little legs sticking out there. But instead of having another fatty acid here, we've added a phosphate group and some other stuff. Okay, so this molecule is really ampipathic. Once we cover up these 
acids. We take these uh, acid groups, hook them to the glycerol. This molecule is not hydrophilic at all. It's very hydrophobic. This molecule, because of the phosphate group, because of the acid group on one end, this end of the molecule is hydrophilic. It can interact with water. This part of the molecule is hydrophobic. We talk about cell membranes. This becomes very important. This is a phospholipid. It's got the lipid on this part, phosphate on this part. This makes it a complex lipid because it's not completely hydrophobic. On to the steroids. Now all steroids have this shape. They have four rings hooked together in this shape. You have three six carbon rings and one five carbon ring and then you stick all sorts of fun stuff on it. This happens to be cholesterol. Cholesterol is vitally important for the health and maintenance of your cell membranes. It's not so good coating your arteries. That's why they generally tell you to watch how much cholesterol you're eating and also they will check your blood to see how much is floating around in it. We want it in the cell membranes. We don't want it floating around in the blood. Now steroids um, in multicellular organisms also show up as hormones, how your body communicates with itself. Okay. But for the purposes of this class, we're mainly going to be talking about their functions within the cell membrane. Let's talk about proteins. The function within the cell of proteins is anything you can imagine. They function in energy storage, there are calories and proteins, structure, they also function in moving the cell through its medium, moving uh, things past the cell, moving things from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell, inside of the cell, outside of the cell, transport within the cell, enzymatic functions, they function in protection, you name it, a protein can do it. So let's talk about the structure of proteins. Proteins are composed of monomers that are called amino acids. Carbohydrates, remember, their monomers are monosaccharides. The monomers of proteins are amino acids. And here is the structure of your basic amino acid. Um, we're not going to worry about chirality, so don't worry about the right hand, left hand. But you have a carbon that's attached to um, a side chain, and these can vary, but it has a hydrogen, an amine group, and a carboxyl group or an acid group. That's why they're called amino acids. Get it? Now when we hook amino acids together we form peptides. If you get enough peptides that are long enough we call it a protein. So let's look at how that happens. Here's our amino acid. Here's our carbon in the center. Here's our side chain in this case. Um, it's a very simple side chain, it's just a hydrogen. We have our amine group over here, we have our acid group. Over here we have another amino acid, here's our amine group, our carbon with our hydrogen. Here the side chain is a little more co complicated, it's a methyl group, and we have our carboxyl or our acidic group. So we remove the hydroxyl group from this side, we remove the hydrogen group from this side, removing water. This is becoming a theme, huh? Dehydration is generally how the cell puts all of its molecules together. And when you break it apart, it's called hydrolysis. Okay. So when you hook these two together through dehydration synthesis, you get what's called a peptide bond. And you start getting a string of amino acids. Now once you get past uh, about six amino acids, and once it's functional, we start calling it a protein. If it's less than six or six, we call it a peptide. When you get a string of amino acids hooked together by peptide bonds, we call this the primary structure. But proteins generally don't stay in this long straight string. They start to fold. And the first set of folds we call the secondary structure. Now there are two main types of secondary structure that we've identified that is important to the functioning of the protein. The first one is if they form a coil going around and around and around and around. Um, ignore the purple balls. I'm not sure why they decided to put those in there. But this makes the molecule springy. 
It gives it an elastic nature, just like a spring. The uh, molecules in your hair and in wool are, have lots of these um, helixes, so it makes it springy, elastic, so your hair can move around. Now, if you want the protein to be very rigid, very stiff, then you can form a pleated sheet. That's where the the primary structure goes back and forth, makes a U-turn, comes back and forth, back and forth, and we're forming hydrogen bonds between the different um, pleats. Okay, and so proteins that are very stiff, that are very rigid, um, have lots of beta pleated sheets. Okay? Now, over here with the helix, helix, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, they're stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds are easier to break than covalent bonds. So if I pull on this side and keep this side stable, these hydrogen bonds break, they stretch out, they stretch out, I let go of it, bing! Back there it's forming those hydrogen bonds again and that's where we get our elasticity. Whereas here, if I were to pull it on this side, it doesn't have as far to go. This U-turn here is going to keep it from pulling too far. So it makes the protein very rigid. Now let's move on to further folding. Now that we've done the secondary structure, the protein can fold further into more shapes and we call this the tertiary or 3D structure. Now if you look at this molecule here, you can see there's an alpha helix there, there's a beta pleated sheet to keep it stable there, and then we have the rest of this and it's being held together in this form. Okay. Now remember that your alpha helix and your beta pleated sheet are held together by hydrogen bonds. And if you look over here, the tertiary structure has some more going on with it. Now here it's the side chains that are coming into play. So we have a side chain here that we've got an acid, okay, and we've got a hydrogen bond or a hydroxyl group, and they can hydrogen bond between the double bonded oxygen and the hydroxyl group you can form a hydrogen bond and it's going to stabilize that part of the molecule. Over here if you look at these side chains this one right here and this one right here there's no oxygen no nitrogen so can't hydrogen bond no ionic interactions so it's hydro hydrophobic interactions they're being excluded by those that can hydrogen bond. Now down here you'll notice that I've got an amine group on the end of this side chain. It's picked up an extra hydrogen, so it's basic. It's got a positive charge. I've got an acid group that's lost its hydrogen, so it's negative. And this positive charge and this negative charge are going to be attracted to each other and we're going to have an ionic bond. Then here we have a sulfhydryl group, a sulfhydryl group here. We've removed the hydrogens and formed a covalent bond between these two portions of the protein, further stabilizing it. So those are the four interactions that can hold together the tertiary structure. Hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bridges, and ionic bonding. Now sometimes you can take two different strings, two different primary structures, and put them together in what we call a quaternary structure. So you'll notice that we have two subunits for this protein. We've got this subunit over here, we've got this subunit over here. In this example they're the same subunit, but the protein isn't functional until the two subunits come together. Now an example of this would be your antibodies. They're composed of four subunits that are bound by disulfide bridges. Okay. Collagen is another one. You get three molecules of collagen coming together um, to form the actual collagen. Okay. And we find that between our the joints of our bones and this is called the quaternary structure. Now what holds these two subunits together are the same thing that holds the tertiary structure together. Hydrogen bonding between the side chains, hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bridge, and ionic bonds. Now with all of this folding you can make any shape you want which leads 
to the vast array of functions that proteins perform in the cell. We'll be talking more about proteins as we go along. All of this lovely organization can be unraveled by breaking these bonds, the hydrogen bonds, um, the ionic bonds, and if you really, really work at it, you can break these disulfide bonds. And this denatures the protein or unwinds it into its primary structure, just the string. Now what happens when you denature a protein is that when you remove whatever it was that was breaking those bonds that held it together in its tertiary, quaternary, or secondary structures, then when it comes back together it forms a different shape. And generally speaking, it doesn't perform the same function that it did before. Think of frying an egg. When you crack the egg into your pan, the yolk is yellow and it's, it's cloudy, but it's a nice deep yellow, almost an orange, and the whites are actually clear and runny. The yolk is also runny, but once you heat it up, and heat will break hydrogen bonds, it'll break uh, ionic bonds, it'll break disulfide bonds because heat is energy and it makes this molecule vibrate. And as it vibrates, these parts of the molecule move further and further apart and you denature the protein. And the yolk becomes a lighter yellow and it becomes solid and the white goes from clear to white and becomes solid also. That's because the proteins in the egg are being denatured. Now, can you make that cooked egg become runny and raw again? No, you can't. Generally, when you denature a protein, it's non-reversible. When you denature proteins by heat or through adding extra acids. You can also cook fish by adding some lemon or lime juice and that breaks these ionic bonds, denatures the protein, also messes with hydrogen bonding. Then you also cook it through use of an acid. Then you can't go back to the original function and it kills microbes. It'll kill us. If you give a human too much heat, it'll denature our proteins and we'll die too because the proteins denature and they stop performing their functions. Okay. Now you can also denature proteins with things like Clorox bleach, but you wouldn't want to eat it afterwards because it would denature the lining of your throat and your stomach all the way down. Generally we pick denaturing agents that come and go or don't bother us too much. Now we're going to be talking about denaturing throughout the course of, well, this class, and I'll be bringing this up again. On to the nucleic acids. As far as structure, nucleic acids are made up of nu nucleotides. These are the monomers of nucleic acids. Nucleotides are composed of a 5-carbon sugar, a ribose, and you have a nitrogenous base, see the nitrogens, we generally abbreviate that as just a base, and you can change these bases to make the different nucleotides. There's five different bases, we'll talk about those later. And then you have a phosphate group. Together the phosphate group, the sugar and the base, make the nucleotide. Now let's talk about the functions of the nucleic acids and nucleotides within the cell. These four groups, excuse me, these three groups, ATP, NAD+, and its other form, NADH, FAD, FADH2, um, are involved in energy transfer within the cell. You've probably heard of ATP, and when you lose, well, let's look at ATP. Here is ATP. We have our ribose, we have our adenine, and we, together, this is adenosine. Now when you put three phosphates on, it's adenosine triphosphate or ATP. You can clip off this phosphate group and move it to a molecule and energy goes with it. And this goes from being ATP to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Okay. So energy moves with the phosphate. We take, can take that phosphate, put it back on to take ADP back up to ATP and it's like putting money in the bank. Now with NADH plus and NAD 
excuse me, NAD plus and NADH, FAD, FADH2, these molecules function in transferring energy around the cell by moving hydrogens around. Now these hydrogens, just like with the phosphate group, when we move it from ATP to another molecule, if you move a hydrogen from one molecule to another, energy goes with it. Okay. Now DNA and RNA function in information transfer within the cell. They transfer information on how to make proteins to, from the genome to the rest of the cell. And we'll be talking about that in more detail. Let's look at the structure of DNA. Now you take your nucleotides and you hook them together by, you guessed it, dehydration reactions between this hydroxyl group and this phosphate group and you make a string of nucleotides that we call a nucleic acid. And in this figure it's represented by this purple ribbon. We call this the sugar phosphate backbone. Now in DNA you get two of these strings together and the bases hydrogen bond to hold this together in the famous double helix of DNA. All right, that's it for this chapter, this uh, compilation of chapters. Now I realize that I've thrown a lot of chemistry at you. It's difficult for a lot of people to comprehend this to get it the first time through. So I would recommend going over this PowerPoint, both parts one and two, uh, several times. Get with me, get with the free tutors um, that CWI offers, and we would all be happy to help you get this. Um, this is important to understanding the functioning of the cell. So don't blow it off thinking, I don't understand it, I'm not even going to try. The more times you go over it, then the more likely you are to have an aha moment where you go, oh, all of a sudden it makes sense. So do spend the time, do spend the time getting to understand this chapter.